what, uh, what we're meaning in the proposal document, you please just type them in the chat and we will uh, answer one by one. Uh, if you have questions about anything else and not the change, you can post that as well. It, there's no, no rules really on that. Although do note, we already had the pineapple on pizza discussion yesterday, so that topic is no longer on the table. Yeah, I think pineapple won. Eh. Yeah, I, th I think pineapple won. <laughs> I mean, everyone who's in here now, uh, what is your view on pineapple? Uh, yay or nay? On pizza, that is. Uh, anchovies on pizza. I don't want fish on pizza personally. I don't know. It's like when you go to, you know, it's, it's, it's so funny. If you order a Caesar salad anywhere, I was like, okay, this is yummy. You go to a nice place, order a Caesar salad. They kind of put a bunch of anchovies on there and you're like, I don't know if I like this, you know, probably prefer a cheaper salad here. <laughs> yes. Do you, do you have the lowbrow Caesar version? Uh, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my favorite is like uh, whenever you can get a wedge salad, I'm like, that's good. I like that. Oh, wedge with bacon and blue cheese. Oh my gosh, you're talking my language. Yeah, I'm getting hungry now. It's uh, it's 5:30 p.m. here, so I was like, uh, we, we gotta stop talking about food, or we're gonna have to cut this short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll stop. We'll stop the food talk. I see some uh, some of you were in uh, here yesterday. Really appreciate uh, everyone who was in the stage yesterday, and you spent you know I think we ended up doing for like two hours. Uh, really nice. Uh, thanks so much for all the good questions you posted, and hopefully you added value. Where where we live? So I am uh, I live in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, right now. Uh, so it's uh, five thirty p.m. Really cold, snow and rain combined, and wind. Uh, I am in the U S in the Atlanta, Georgia area. It is a nice 60 degrees outside with no snow, no, nothing, just pleasant birds chirping. Uh, that sounds, that sounds, sounds nice. Oh, hungry. Cool. Yeah. I've, <clears throat> I've, it's so exciting watching the map. I mean, whenever we get like a, a new antenna somewhere, it's always exciting, but it's extra exciting. I saw we got one on, on Iceland. Uh, Anchorage, Alaska, which was really cool. Uh, saw some over, you know, Taiwan and uh, Japan next to Nagoya, kind of outside Tokyo. It's really fun to just see people joining from from all over the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's pretty cool. See if, uh, I mean, if no one has, uh, you know, feel free to, you know, if you don't have questions about the project per se, like, uh, ask anything if you want to, you know, uh, if we can answer, we'll answer, uh, you know, I'm not going to give you my, my uh, social security number, but <laughs> outside of that, it's pretty open. Hey, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, go for it. So Robin, mm -hmm. you, you're in, you're in Sweden right now. But I understand you've been in the U.S. before. Yeah, so I uh, I moved to the U.S. when I was 17 uh, in 2006. Uh, I went to college, UT Knoxville, go Vols. Hopefully I'm not pissing anyone off. Um, I played college golf there, and I ended up living in the U.S. for 14 years. So I actually have a dual citizenship. I'm American and Swedish citizen. Uh, let's see, we got a question. Uh, if we choose to get tokens instead of a refund for Hex's purchase, what is the percentage of coins that will be distributed to us? So essentially what will happen is when we get, when we release the token, it will have a release price, essentially a, a value. And however many tokens are needed to be at the value of the refund. So let's, let's just say for ease of calculation, you bought one Hex, you want tokens for that, and you're in uh, beta. Okay, you get $22 worth of tokens re refunded. If that is, you know, let's say that's 100 tokens, then we're just going to set aside those 100 tokens, and those are the amount of tokens that will be distributed over time, regardless of what happens with the price. It's You get a set amount of tokens. 
uh, for the initial value, and then we'll just distribute the, the tokens over time. Does that make sense, uh, living in Dallas? I love how everybody's probably looking at the typing icon down below the uh, text. It's, of, it's like a lot of pressure when you're typing, and it's like, ah, oh, better not misspell. Yeah. Yeah, I know some people had asked, like, would it change over time based on whatever the value of the token is? And obviously that complicates things a lot as well. Yeah, so it will, it will just be uh, how many tokens at that initial value will be needed. And we'll just set that aside and you will get it over the, over time. So, yeah, if the price goes up, uh, you still get the same amount of tokens. Uh, it's just, you know, split. What percentage would be over time? So right now in the proposal, it is uh, because we want what we want to avoid uh, for everybody's sake is that we give everyone tokens and we flood the market. So the proposal now has it over 12 months. So if it's 120 tokens, it's 10 tokens a month just airdropped over a year, essentially. So it'd be exactly the same yeah, kind of like percentages each month. month. And uh, sometimes I'm not good at explaining things. So if you don't understand, you're not going to hurt my feelings by asking more. Ah, good question, Rotor Rocket. So will you let us know how many took the refund or the tokens? He wants to know uh, which way the wind's blowing. All right. Mm. That's a good question. I actually, I have not even thought about that. Uh, maybe that's something we need to discuss. Uh, and see, I don't know if there's an issue with showing it or, or not. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, I would guess that most people will take the tokens just because I think most people are here to make tokens, uh, from, uh, kind of the project, but you know, it may be that someone spent a lot of money on hexes. Maybe the situation was a little different than they actually need the money. So we at least wanted to offer both options. Yeah, Simeon, I like that math. Man, that's the way I live my life, actually. If I if I spend, oh, I know money... I didn't. Yeah, yeah, I know I didn't really answer your question, Rotor Rocket, because I, I don't have an answer right now. But I I will think about it. I mean, once it's uh, all said and done, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it does. So, yeah. Yeah. It's... Cerberus asked if there's going to be a staking model. It's nothing we have thought of right now. I mean, staking models in general, I, I don't I don't want to talk badly about them because they definitely have their uses. Uh, but it's generally something that matters for a lot of people when the market's having issues or they're not feeling like they're getting a return um, on what they put in. And it's, it's that whole idea of like, I, I need to feel like I'm generating something in this case, there's, there's miners. If you want to call them that there's ground stations there, there's a device that is going to be generating token rewards. Uh, so that somewhat speaks for itself and how the project and business is doing going forward and what that yeah. reflects. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I my background is not super heavily in Web three. Besides buying into a lot of different uh, tokens before, and I staked quite a lot of tokens, both in the ETH two stake, Sandbox. I think I staked forever. Uh, I mean, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Uh, but I, I don't think we're gonna nothing we've thought of. So not on the roadmap. By the way, while we're waiting for a next question or something, uh, we are actively working on the documentation site as well at this, literally at this exact moment before we started this, we've been working on it. So uh, we will have updated documentation to reflect this new plan, hopefully make it clear, obviously removing supporter and core from that description, having different formulas and everything that that should make it simpler just by being less verbose, uh, but we are trying to take a second pass and even improve on how we were doing documentation before, including adding optimization suggestions for your 
set up and so frequently asked questions. So really making a big yeah. effort to do that. Yeah, because what uh, what we want to include in the documentation is that since you know we we talk to a lot of customers, um, we we think we can actually write a pretty good guide on how to maximize rewards based on what type of data points you can capture, and it would be really hard for people to know that if they're not like really into the space and talking to these data buyers. So we will create essentially a how-to guide on you know. What 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 all can you do to maximize rewards based from like optimizing the antenna, uh, location, and type of data points? For example, I mean it's going to be in the guide anyway. But if if you can get your antenna so that you have clear line of sight on an airport runway, you're most likely going to capture a lot of data points that no one else will capture in that area because they will only be able to catch the planes like way up in the sky, whereas you get all the data points from you know maybe few thousand feet and below down to ground level that's a that's probably the best thing outside of obviously optimizing your antenna yeah yeah uh, let's see uh do, do, do. Simeon, uh will you accepting contributions to the documentation i i really you know we will aim to work towards more towards open source because i you know we have a lot of really smart people in the community so i i don't see why not i mean i think that would be a really good idea a lot of knowledgeable people in the project. Uh, so yeah, we have, we're obviously not there right now, but that would, that would be a really good idea. In the uh, meantime, morning, I... sorry. Yeah, go ahead. In the meantime, if, if you do have documentation, documentation suggestions, uh, you can add them in the suggestions channel and we'll talk about it and incorporate it. And just for, for reference right now, the, the current doc site, uh, you can obviously tell it's using a um, Gitbook. Gitbook. So it is actually based on open source. There are uh, documentation merges. There It is being version controlled, tracked. So we are part way to that. We're just not in the open contribution phase yet, but we are getting there. Mike, uh, on Simeon's uh, second piece there, uh, how to use multiple receivers on one read SB instance. Is that kind of what we talked about earlier? Uh, yes and no. It depends. Like, someone could use it for multiple reasons. Obviously, you could try to run uh, UAT. You could have 978 megahertz versus 1090 megahertz, and you need to serialize the receivers. And if anybody in here, if that's going way over your head right now, don't worry about it. You don't need to know about it. Uh, but it's, it's a good point that there's additional documentation that can be done to talk about multiple receivers using read SB, how you serialize it, how you can merge data. We, we literally, before this call, we were chatting somewhere else talking about, uh, the idea of someone having a, a very funky installation environment where they have uh, restrictions on where they can put an antenna and maybe balconies or something. Maybe they have a forward facing balcony and a rear balcony, but they can't go higher. How can they provide data for basically as many directions as possible? And we were just having the discussion about the theory of having some kind of merging or basically a reverse splitter uh, on an antenna. So you could have one antenna on the front half or front patio, one on the rear patio. They go to the same Pi or the same receiver, whatever whatever unit you're using to run the software, and then merge those signals and submit them to the project. So we are talking about it. I mean, um, are you seeing the comment, Mike? Um, yeah. Just so everyone knows, my background is not technical, so I'm gonna do divert any technical stuff to Mike or Alex. But he's he he can't be here, unfortunately. He's having some personal. Uh, his wife is not is a little sick, uh, so he has to help her out. So, <clears throat> Air Spy, a hundred percent, I agree, and I would actually like to pick one up to play with it. Um. So overall. 
I guess the, the you're not derailing at all. I guess overall, this is a discussion we do need to have. Obviously, we've had our focus on some other aspects of the project as obvious by the reason we're here. Uh, but this is stuff that we would like to push forward on, document and test. Uh, very soon after, uh, probably the next two weeks or so, I'm going to try to start picking up some other equipment and testing stuff and seeing what we can do to provide real world examples. I know it's, it's great to Google and get, you know, 300 different sources from usually about four or five different forums but it is tough to like get all the information without sifting through so much other stuff. So I, I would love for us to be a, uh, this is to your point. I think I would love for us to be a reasonably solid source of solid information for setting this stuff up, not just for our project, but in general, like where if people are trying to do this for even someone else submitting data to another another project us having the information out there and being able to help them would be great we we just we just need to flesh through all of it and it's a lot and obviously i am open to any help you're willing to provide uh any stuff you've run through and, and had problems with and learned from i i i open it with i take it with open arms so you and i can keep chatting outside of this Sorry, there's a fire truck outside my house, so I am diverting my attention for a moment. Well, hopefully it's not your house. <laughs> yeah, one, one second. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Serge says, I live in the center of Amsterdam, but I can't place an antenna in line of sight. Are you, uh, Serge, are you saying you can't play, place it like high up on the building? Um, like, are you placing it on your balcony? Okay. So, I mean, if you have a choice, if you can at least put an antenna outside and not inside that's definitely the best uh if you can put it on the balcony i mean you're you're still gonna cover quite a bit i don't know exactly how close the buildings are next door you know what the, what the space is between um, but you'll still be able to capture quite a bit of data i mean for example for i live in an apartment building i have my antenna on the balcony and there's another building kind of right in front of me and i'm still getting not as much obviously as someone put it on the roof but um it's definitely still worthwhile. Uh, I think yeah, Simeon posted uh, some nice little articles there uh, for you to look at too. But it's very hard when I don't I don't know exactly where you live. It's hard to give you a really good answer. Um, new and let's see. Let me read a question. Yeah. So I mean, I know. Um, Again, I speak a little bit out of my knowledge zone here, but like I know there's several of the Helium devices we can use that are compatible. And that, that's something like what Mike was mentioning, that over time uh, we want to create guides for all types of different devices that so you can use them for our project or maybe multiple projects. Uh, but right now we first need to finish this guide, but it's a great idea and it's definitely on the roadmap for that new one. Thank you. So for anybody that's joined late, if you have questions related to the uh, participation plan change, feel free to ask in chat. If you have questions related to anything else related to wing bits, ask in chat. If you're just curious about, uh, you know, Robin's favorite uh, car, ask that, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not really a car person, but uh, I, I wouldn't mind. I mean, there's a few cars I wouldn't mind, but uh, it's not something I lose sleep over. Uh, Mr. B, so the, the the Hex 6 map within our platform will be released next week. Uh, Mike, do you have the Wolf, uh, the Wolf, the uh, yeah, Hex viewer? Yeah, yeah, on this, Mike will link the URL. You can go in there and essentially just scroll in until it gets to resolution six, and then you can kind of see what it looks like. Okay, yes, I uh, I used to be really heavily uh, invested in crypto. So, I mean, I started maybe in like 20, middle of 2017. Um, I 
Went up a lot, went down a lot. I still have quite a bit, but not as much as I used to. Um, yeah, I still have, but it's mainly like I have I have a portfolio on Binance uh, that I have, but it's it's not not something I spend a lot of time on, especially now. Now I just focus on trying to build this. Ancillary, you had a question with a Res Six. Uh, so I looked this up last night. I use a a. I uh, think it's ten kilometers. Oh, I, I did. I, I used a hexagon calculator just to just to oh. double check everything. It is, and I, I have it somewhere in Discord actually, in uh, I think in the participation uh, WIP channel. But it's like three point seven something miles, and it's like six point two or three kilometers across. So if you okay. go from parallel side to parallel side, that is the width of it. So it's it's smaller than I thought uh, now that I actually looked at the actual number because I assumed it was, you know, generically about a certain size. I thought it was about five miles, um, but it is a little bit smaller than I thought. So it's it's actually a it one of the most interesting things. As I said before, I'm in the Atlanta, uh, Georgia area in the U.S., and if you go look at Hartsfield International Airport, which is the technically the busiest airport in the world uh, by one of the metrics, it fits. I don't know. Obviously, they didn't design it this way, but the, the hex actually covers the entire uh, dual terminal. There are three different sets of runways and everything all fit and just perfectly inside of one hex and a little bit of, of stuff around it, like some hotels crazy yeah and and there's been quite a few questions in uh, both the proposal post but also in general uh, like about hex relating to rewards that the resolution six hex does not have an effect on rewards it only serves to essentially claim your antenna spot and have a spot in the project it doesn't affect the rewards in any way rewards are only from based on coverage and uptime so whatever amount of data you capture in a specific hex versus the other people in that hex and your uptime level but you still get rewarded for all the hexes you can cover at yeah, resolution six yeah. Yeah. Uh, three, yeah, exactly. sorry. three yeah that's the coverage uh, rewards hex map is the same as the one we have now the sky hex same size as cj said what's the timeline to get a refund so we're actually finalizing the Google form. Uh, we just want to make sure we have all the information. Everyone will get an email with a summary of the change, and then the Google form will be attached. There you have an option to select, obviously, refund or token drop. We will collect answers until end of this month. Uh, until then, you can change your mind by going back into the form and edit your answer. After this, by the end of this month, we will Come, collect all the answers and start issuing refunds right away. Um, and, ancillary, did did you just delete what you said? I could have sworn I just no, saw it was, you. It, it was CG. It was CG. He posted a new one. Uh, no, or CG. And, okay. Oh, ancillary sorry. did. He said the the hexes seem rather small, and I, I just wanted. To, were you done with the refund thing? Sorry, Robin. Yeah, so we, we start issue refunds on March 1st. Or, yeah, March 1st, February. Yeah, March 1st. Okay. Ancillary had just jumped in and said he made an observation, which was made yesterday as well, that the hexes seem really small. Yes, intentionally. I mean, if you look at the project, there's 343 of these uh, location assertion hexes within a rewards hex. Obviously, we don't need and don't want 343 people uh, deploying in every resolution three hex, that would be insane. Uh, so we will keep an eye on things and provide potentially an artificial limit and kind of cap it out before things could get out of control and dilute people. Uh, but we did compare multiple resolutions. Resolution seven gets really small uh, plus you have seven times the number of hexes again and resolution five was just a little bit too big where it could impact uh, current participants. And we also started comparing 
uh, Robin and I and others, we, we went to like random cities and like zipped around and looked and saw what fit in, what didn't fit in, how tightly packed locations were. So there was a lot of effort back and forth as far as what is the right hex size that we think will be a good balance. That way you don't have yeah. your next door neighbor doing a install as well, because that doesn't help us if, if the antennas are literally on top of each other. Uh, but we don't want people to spread out either. So it was a balancing act. Yeah. And, and just what Mike said, like, this is all, this stems from um, talking to our uh, data buyers. Uh, we know we need to reach a certain level of redundancy. And, you know, with the current model in a lot of areas, we essentially limit ourselves before we reach where we need to go. With this model, we will reach where we need to go. And we know, like, at, we will essentially know exactly at what point we need to cap it because we see it in the data. Uh, so it, this is a better model uh, and we can monitor the, the saturation very easily. Well, um, zero, I mean, okay. Obviously everybody's gonna have an opinion on the plan, good or bad, and that's fine. Um, if you have a specific issue with this plan versus the previous one, we're here to ask answer questions about that specific case, it's difficult to, to respond to a, this is bad versus this is good. Either way, it's hard to respond to that. Um, I, I do want to respond to the fire truck because obviously two people care. I don't know. It drove, it drove into our cul-de-sac, stayed for a while and left. Usually they are first responders in case of a uh, medical emergency. So one of our neighbors may have had something going on. Uh, let's see, what should we call it? Uh, so on the hex refund, uh, you will receive an email uh, with the summary and the form. Uh, all you have to do in the Google form is select the option. And you have until the end of the month to select and or change your mind. Uh, after this month is over, we'll issue all the refunds and uh, record the people that want the token drop. So you don't, you just have to answer the form. If you don't answer the form at all, and you never answer it, you will get a refund by default. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, let's see, uh, Dan. So one other reason why we also need more redundancy is to actually be able to enable MLAT because the, we don't have enough uh, antenna density to do MLAT right now. Rotor rocket. Duplicate data would not penalize antennas already established. Like, are you saying that if a lot of antennas come in, in the same area, sending the same data, will that penalize your antenna? Is that what you're meaning? Uh, so, hmm. I mean, obviously, that's why we need to monitor saturation because. So essentially right now the reward system is set up where whatever contribution percentage of total data in a hex that you send versus other people uh, will be your value. So the duplicate data is actually needed. We need enough duplicate data for the redundancy, uh, but that's why we need to cap the specific areas when it reaches that redundancy to avoid it getting oversaturated where everyone gets diluted too much. So it won't really penalize, but there, there will obviously be more competition in some areas, which will diminish the amount of rewards you can get a little bit. You, but you also, the best antennas, really good setups will still capture the most amount of the data in, in each hex. I don't know if that answered your question correctly, but if not, I'd be happy to try to answer more clearly. Maybe if you want to DM me and we can, we can dive a little deeper into it. Uh, ancillary, how is the token drop value figured? What people pay in whatever currency that's not set a coin value. So when the token value is going to be determined on the release price. So if you pay the $20, however many tokens it takes at the release price to get to $20 or 22 or if you're beta, you choose that. That's how many tokens you get. And the same thing, the value versus euro, for example. So those are the only two currencies we've charged in. 
so it will just uh, we'll just do a currency conversion. So it'll be the same. So double so question. The, oh, the, yeah. yeah, but the, also the token value will. I mean, the initial value is because we are adding liquidity to the foundation that handles the token, and that will set an initial value. So Dan has asked uh, how customers, clients of Wingbits will be paying for the data. How will they get access to it? Are they going to use tokens or fiat or what will happen? Uh, right now it's looking like you pay with tokens and customers pay with tokens. Uh, the, we're still evaluating essentially a couple of models. One, is it, do you only pay with tokens? Or do you have an option to pay with token or fiat? Because essentially what happens is, let's say the token is a really low price and you need, let's say, 10 tokens to get X amount of data. It makes total sense. If the token price gets really high, then it no longer makes business sense to, to buy the data because it's too expensive. So that's kind of part of the whole tokenomics. We're trying to uh, talk to customers, talk to people in the space and figure out what is the best option here to ensure that it's sustainable throughout the life of the project. Uh, so I most likely lean towards tokens for the, for the data. And the follow-up was, uh, what's the realistic time frame before there's a market for participants uh, to exchange tokens and move stuff in oh, and okay. out? Okay, yeah. So that's really why we're making sure we, we, like as the company or foundation, we need to add enough initial liquidity to provide that uh, the option for people to sell if they want to. Uh, so when we release the token, we will also make sure there is liquidity. So that's why we're not gonna release the token and no one can sell any token. CG, you wanna know if there's any plan to restrict having too many antennas within the same hex and obviously we're talking about resolution three rewards hex and yes as discussed uh basically well i'll let robin take it he he's actually got a really good spiel for this so no no but so we're like right now what we're doing with the the customers it's we're providing them with data samples and they're giving us continuous feedback on for example one of those things being redundancy in specific areas and based on that feedback, we will know exactly when we reach a good level of redundancy in an area. And as soon as we reach that, we will cap that area so no one else can join. Because past that point, it makes no sense for us to have more antennas. And it makes no sense for the community to have more antennas. But uh, we, does that make sense, DG? But we will have some mechanism by which, I mean, obviously people could fall off the network or go dark or whatever. So the idea would be that there, there is some way that you can also be notified or get, get your hex, uh, uh, claimed, exactly. claimed if yeah. there is an opening. Yeah. But it, it, when we reach those points, we know the amount. So then it's easy. Like, okay, if one drops off, one spots open up, uh, kind of deal. Uh, ancillary yeah so there is obviously an option for, for if you want to buy the data for example to say okay let's say uh, one hour of data is one dollar but if you pay in tokens it's 75 cents to uh, encourage people to use tokens for the data so it's we're, we're thinking about all of them and we're doing a lot of modeling to see which one is best but we haven't landed on, on a final uh, decision on that one. Let's see. Simeon, let me read your question. He's basically stating that it, it's kind of obvious in the deep end world that there's, when you're dealing with traditional brick and mortar businesses, they, they don't sometimes care or want to know about crypto. And that's an uphill battle to try to convince them, get our crypto so yeah. you can buy our data. But yeah, that's why yeah, you and, work and, at it. Yeah, and Simeon, we have we have solved that, solved that. Uh, we have obviously the, we will have the Web three Foundation uh, managing you know community and the token supply and all that stuff, 
And we also have a regular for-profit company, which is unrelated. And that company will have to buy data from the foundation with tokens or whatever. And then it simply resells the data to the buyers. That way, that company can help feed liquidity back into, uh, back into the foundation. Yeah. Hey, hey, Ciro. I I see your question. I, I I see your comment. I don't. If you you know, I uh, agree. We're also really. I mean, the main thing for us is long term sustainability, uh, because we we don't want this a project that's uh, you know really cool and works for you know six months to a year and then dies out. That's why you know we're taking our time working on the rewards models, the tokenomics. And continuously, you know, talking to customers because we are 100% sure we have a real use case. I mean, we're working on integrating with the first customer. Uh, we've validated this. We just need to figure out how to sustainably feed uh, the community uh, so that it actually works over the long term. Uh, I'm going to skip below some of the comments. Uh, it's just conversation. Uh, Mr. B is asking for a timeline for testnet mainnet. And my protest. So uh, when it comes to, the, you know, right now we're working on the tokenomics and w we don't want to release the test net, like the t test net token and all that before we have the tokenomics set. We are about 70% done with the tokenomics. So I, I would, I mean, again, I'm estimating here, so please don't hold me to this. I would estimate that we need another two to three weeks, at least maybe four to finalize tokenomics. Because like it's it's super important that we get the tokenomics as correct as we can. After we have the tokenomics uh, set, we have the foundation and everything set up, so we could mint a token whenever we want now. Uh, so hopefully the testnet would be uh, Q3 ish, uh, end of Q2, uh, and then hopefully mainnet mainnet will come this year, either late Q3 or early Q4. I would I would guess. Uh, Dan S. Yes, it's a nonprofit. Blockchain. Question: What blockchain are we on? Peak. Have we picked one? Yes. Um, Peak uh, is the blockchain. Uh, Robin can can speak to why that was chosen, uh, but just to to head off the secondary question from Ancillary about uh, Thoroughput. Remember that we are not shoving the data through a blockchain. Can you imagine? Um, what we're doing is we're using it for rewards and, and other uh, utility stuff. So, Robin, can you speak about Peak? Yeah, I mean, we so we chose, so the ones we looked at, I mean, obviously we looked a little bit at IOTEX, but we looked mainly at Solana and Peak. I know a lot of people love Solana. We also love Solana. But really why we ended up going with Peak was because, you know, we really believe they have a good model. They're focusing on the deep in segment. They have a lot of really cool, good tools. Yeah, exactly. See me on Peak with the Q. Uh, really nice tools that we can use so we can actually spend more time focusing on building the project rather than building all these tools that we need. Um, and we're getting a lot of support from them in terms of, you know, just assistance in general. Uh, so we, we just like, and we love the team. We spent a lot of time evaluating that. We spent a lot of time with their team uh, and we ended up landing on it. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm really happy about it so far. Uh, everything we're doing with them and will do. There are some really exciting things coming out that I can't share yet with them, uh, but I'm happy about the choice so far. Send me on to your to your uh, question about or statement about no broad wallet or exchange support. I uh, I actually don't think I'm the right person to answer. You probably know more of me than that, but Mike, maybe you have more insight. But I know Alex would be able to answer it better if he was here. Uh, but send me on any any feedback, anything you know. If you ever feel something, hey, have you thought about this? Send us a message. Send it to Alex. Suggestion channel, because uh, you know we know there's a lot of. A lot of big brains out in our community. Uh, so please don't hesitate to give us feedback or input.
Hey, a uh, quick, quick note, Robin, I am going to pause for a second. Also, there's apparently something else going on in the cul-de-sac, so I'll be back in a second. Okay, that's fine. So while, while Mike is gone, don't ask me any questions that are too, uh, too hard. <laughs> Yeah, there's a couple of questions coming. Now, I, I, I think actually, uh, I'm I'm the bad guy on this one. I like pineapple on pizza. I think Mike doesn't like it. I I do think Peak has a Fiat on ramp. So, Janutz, are you uh, are you a pineapple on pizza fan or or no? So why do so many of these projects use a foundation? So uh, w the biggest reason is because you don't, you know, if you have a foundation, there's not an owner. So essentially a community, like the foundation is its own entity. That, so the community essentially owns it. That's one. But also two, uh, because unfortunately, you know, the world is slow to adopt to crypto regulation. And so like, for example, in our, in our case, we need to have a traditional company on one end that sells data to these enterprise clients, but that company cannot really be directly related, correlated or tied to the crypto company due to regulation purposes. So that's why we split them. Um, but main thing is like, you don't want one person owning the entire company that handles the token. So there's no owner on foundation. It's owned by the community. Uh, yeah, Janut's real, real quick. The, the, uh, what is it? Dpinhub.io. Uh, you can start to look and see what projects are on, uh, different chains and getting support. And there, there's definitely some good reading at the peak network. There's a discord that you can follow. Although depending on where you're sitting in their discord, you can either be really confused by what's going on, what they're discussing, or uh, be on a level where you're like, okay, I, I understand what they're saying. I've, I've put, my, put myself into areas in there that I was like, okay, I'm out of my depth. I need to uh, back out and go to somewhere where people are talking about fun stuff that I understand. Um, yeah. But I mean, to, to Simeon's, uh, to your comment there, like we obviously know that selecting a more established chain is safer in a way but we also believe there's more upside and more uh, po potential in choosing peak yes there's a little higher risk which we're accounting for and we're essentially making sure we have a backup if something happened and we do really believe that it will be a good choice long term based on how the market is going all the research and due diligence we did on peak all the investors that invested in Peak, we talked to all of them, why they invested there, what they see moving into the future. So we feel like we made a very calculated decision that we think will pan out really well. Uh, marketing strategy. Uh, at this stage, uh, we, uh, we haven't thought about marketing strategy that much because we simply don't have the manpower to focus on that yet. We will start focusing on that when but we need to make sure we set all the all the technical stuff, like make sure all this works kind of right here, right now, and then we will start focusing on that. Because I mean, we have not we launched beta on November second, so it's still we're still a young business, still very new. There's a lot to do. Um, uh, yes, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Just just as a comment, because I've I've dealt with this before in a different capacity. The whole getting listed on exchanges is generally just a, a huge money play. If you're willing to dump them a lot of coin uh, and agree to their fees and liquidity that you have to provide, then you get listed. The question is always whether it's worth being on a certain chain or not for your project, uh, whether it opens you up to too much volatility or if it's a good thing because it provides more uh, potential viewers, participants that, that see your stuff. 
but it, it's really just a money play. Like if you're willing to slap down a, a big stack of stuff, you'll get where you want to go. I guess that's kind of like a lot of places in the world. Um, just as a final note, so I can close up the topic on the fire engine, because we had another one. Turns out they were doing something with the, the, with the, what do you call it? The hydrants. They were squirting water out. So I guess it wasn't a big deal. Maybe they were hearing you and they're they're like, man, man, this voice is fire. We need to go check it out. Yeah. I think they're just testing to make sure that if there is a fire, then they turn the knob that water actually comes out. Yeah. Um, on the see where I, oh new and streamer we ha have talked about streamer it's I like it the project it's actually right now the way it works it would be very risky for us to use it in terms of uh, the commercial aspect um, uh, with the customers and if Alex was here he could explain exactly why but we had a long discussion about that uh, do we feel like the new helium? uh will you learn yes uh, <clears throat> so alex i mean i think maybe mike too i mean we have a lot of people on the team that have been very involved in helium uh we talked to people that deployed all the helium devices in in europe here or sweden so we have learned a lot from them uh, good and bad uh so that's definitely positive and that's one thing with you know the not allowing too much saturation uh in certain areas uh thanks Simon. yes we'll we'll definitely do that yeah, and, and just to that point, Simeon, I, I am a member of many projects and I can firsthand empathize with anybody who has joined a project with great expectations of fun and, and joy and then tried to hook up a wallet and do something with it. And you're searching for a guide online or some kind of information written or video that'll help you through it. And it takes you forever. I am a hundred percent committed to make sure we are not in that situation that if you need to hook stuff up and figure out how things work, we will have some way, some video, some written stuff that will explain it like a five-year-old so you can get through it. Cause I don't, I don't want to be a purveyor of, of some of the, challenges i've had to endure yeah and we're i i think we there was a video posted which was good in a way but like i i really don't like the whole make money out of thin air like guaranteeing thousand x like we're we're building a, a real business we're gonna feed that money into the community if everything works out that should be good over time but like we're not gonna promise certain returns or you know, quick riches like that. It's we're trying to build a really good long term sustainable project. Just just a quick point back to the the helium uh, comparison. I, I understand where you're going with that and I agree, but I, I also want to put forth that that was a weird glitch. I think that was a sound from Robin's machine. Um, I want to put forward that there's also when you we were building up helium as participants, for example, there the idea was that you're going to have IoT devices everywhere that we're gonna that we're gonna connect with data, and we were going to try to figure out how to how to monetize that as a, as a project, that kind of feel. But as you've seen over time, the the real world case is a little more challenging. It takes time for people to sometimes catch up to that use case and have devices that make sense. Obviously they pivoted in a different direction now and that is awesome. Um, but I think where Wingbit stands apart is there's already consumers of this data. There's already people who want it. Uh, we're not banging on doors asking random people, would you like our, our stuff? Uh, there, there's people out there that we can target, that we can discuss with and have these conversations and those are our potential clients it's, it's not trying to make a whole new market or a new category which is really cool yeah yeah and that's uh and that's <clears throat> that whole point of validating the business case that's the only reason we received our initial investment from antler and you know just to put it in perspective out of over a thousand investments they've made there's only been three that has a Web3 component. 
So like we've spent a lot of time validating because you know you, you can't start a business without knowing that okay what you're producing actually has real world value because like in the end of the, at the end of the day you need to make money or you're kind of gonna die. Yeah, ba, 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 ba. or missing something, Mike? Do you want to handle the Planet Watch uh, since you're you're more familiar with that? Uh, sure. I was just catching up. First, thank you, Zero Cool. I appreciate it. Time was spent on that, and uh, I appreciate that the efforts were not wasted. Um, Planet Watch used a good idea for saturation with tears and hexes. Principle device which gets hex first earns more rewards first. Day. Yeah, so yeah, that is one way to go, new one. And, uh, I, I obviously am not going to speak, uh, either pro or against planet watches, uh, plans and what they've done in the past. Uh, I think I have definitely learned some lessons from the project, good and bad. So we're doing what we think makes sense. Uh, what we've worked out through a lot of, I don't know, a lot, a lot of discussion and, uh, scenario, uh, kind of play out yeah it's i mean also they're you know what they're trying to do is a little different than what we're trying to do so it needs a little bit of different model i think uh just 100 percent transparency for anybody sitting here yes i am still a moderator at planet watch discord yes i'm on their fireside videos but i am committed to wing bits Thanks, Mike. We're we like we really like having you here. Let's see. Boop, 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 boop. Um, any other questions uh, people have? I mean, we're uh, I'll stay as long as, as 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 you guys want. I mean, you it's really important for me that you feel that we uh, we take time and and answer your questions. And um, I just want to want everyone to feel good about what's going on and understand it so they can make all the right decisions. Will we be able to trade a token on the DEX? So, I mean, we go ahead, Mike. Well, no, I, I was, I was going to say that, uh, to be honest, not that I want to be here, but I have not looked to see what DEX development is going on on peak uh for a test net with the future of mainnet so i can't speak to it but when it comes to the liquidity pool yes we will provide liquidity I am remarkably noticing right now that we have a larger audience right at this moment than we did yesterday when it was just announced. Yeah, well, and, and again, I, I think I said this yesterday too. I mean, this is not like the last stage of all time. Uh, don't mind doing them. I mean, I can do them on a monthly basis if people just want to come in and chat and uh, ask questions and it's really fun to do these. I really appreciate it, people showing up. Um, and also, we can definitely do some more throughout next week as there will be more people coming on. Maybe we should schedule one ahead of time so people can plan. Yeah. And we, we've even talked about impromptu use of this stage to just drop in uh, when we have time available and just have chats with people like this, whether you want to discuss pineapple on pizza or whether you actually want to discuss uh, aspects of the project. Or fire trucks. Or, or fire trucks. Yeah. Who doesn't like yeah. a fire truck? Yeah, yeah that, that's very true. Uh, how often is the sale of data? Uh, so, yeah, Lord, your question. When it, so, data buyers buy it in different ways. So, some buyers want historical packages for maybe like 24 hours at a time. Some people want essentially a live stream of data. Some people want the data completely raw, no deduplication, nothing. Some people want the data enriched. Some people want to deduplicate it. Uh, so it depends. Some people just want some, they can do a pull request every now and then and they pay per request. Uh, the pricing models can get quite complex, but for, for like a really big buyer, let's say like uh, what they want is a flat price 
for the data and they get a live stream of all our data, but we need to clean it up. Yeah, I mean, uh, Simia, like there's, uh, I have, um, we have this, I mean, backlog of an idealist essentially with like a million things because like as we grow and we get a little more resources and, and essentially time or people or developers, uh, there's so many cool things we feel like we can do to, you know, enrich the experience on our platform that makes it more fun to be in here. I mean, I hope you guys are having fun now, but we want to continuously add value to the user experience. So there's a lot of cool things we want to do. But again, please, suggestion channel. Like, there's no dumb ideas. If you have a crazy idea that you want to see in the future, please post it. Uh, Multi-chain IDs. Uh, Doc Brown's asking about Peak and some of the features they have. I think really, I mean, I won't speak for Robin, but I personally think Alex would be the best person to respond to some of this. He might have had more technical uh, research on this, but I may be wrong. Robin yeah. may be the master. No, Alex is the master on this, but yeah, I mean, it it should create some existing options. I know they just released her wormhole. I mean, they they peak like if you follow if you I know some people like haven't seen peak, and they don't really know what it is. But if you just like keep updated with their progress, there's literally such cool things and developments and progress happening on a weekly basis. I, I and I think if people follow it, like it's a an amazing project, and. You know, I, they just, I think they just raised like a hundred million dollars. Like they have a lot of cool stuff going on. I feel like saying wow after that, but I won't say it. Yeah. Wow. It is. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm wowed. I think, I mean, they're really, really cool. Yeah. Janut sent a wow. Yeah. I think they deserve a wow. I mean, they're doing amazing stuff. Lord uh, Carbon Dioxide, how will my reward be impacted if I live nowhere near heavy air traffic? Maybe just two or five plane datas come through in 24 hours. No problem. Uh, your will, your, your, all right, I, I'm not able to speak this morning. Your rewards will not be impacted by the number of flights that you track. As long as you are tracking what is available in the resolution three hex. So if you're in a location where the overhead traffic is literally just a few planes a day, uh, you are still, and your sole contributor in that area, you're still reward to the maximum, just like someone else who is a sole contributor and next to an airport. Uh, it's about collecting all the data that you can within that resolution three hex. And then again, each resolution three hex is rewarded independently during a, say a daily reward engine run. So one by one, all resolution three hexes are evaluated. Who submitted data? What was their uptime based on the uptime level? What was their percentage contribution towards that hex? Uh, and then proportionally you would be rewarded from out of the, reward pool for that hex. So however yeah. many tokens are allocated, you get your percentage based on your contribution. So it all works out. Yeah, and, and the base base reward, every hex on the map has the same amount of total daily rewards. Because why we do that, people may think, oh, is it not more valuable getting a lot of data next to an airport? Yes and no. The issue would be like, we need the entire flight. So there needs to be an incentive for people to deploy in remote areas and catch the few planes that are there. That's actually very important. So that's why we decided it's fair. Everyone, every hex has the same rewards. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, let's see. Thanks for posting that uh, docs there, Simeon. Uh, let's see, so you're cool. Uh, start, are we going to offer a start package with Wingbins brand? Wingbins brand? Yes, so that's the plan. Uh, we're we're looking into designing uh, hardware now to complement. You know, if people don't want to build their own, if they want more of a plug and play device, uh, we are going to offer that. Uh, with hardware, you know, the main thing if we're gonna sell hardware to the community, we wanted to make sure the hardware is really good. 
uh, so you don't you know get worse performance by buy, buying our hardware versus building your own. And you know obviously if you're a super super interested in this space and you're very knowledgeable and you go all out crazy and building something amazing, yeah, but it needs to be a good standard hardware. But it will come. Uh, Hector's asking about NFTs in general. You know, we obviously Skyhex originally there was discussion about it being an NFT and there might be a marketplace and everything uh, so that they could be transferred to a new owner. Obviously, this new plan kind of does away with that. But internally, there has been discussions and I would welcome anyone else to come up with some cool things, but discussions about how NFTs could be used. I don't want to make this a meme uh, like you just get an image and hey, there's your Wingbits NFT, but something that ties in directly to what we're doing, like whether you track a certain plane or you track a, a certain number of planes or so, I don't know. But there, there's opportunity there. I don't think we want to spend a ton of time focusing on that. I think NFTs have somewhat had their days uh, that have passed. I, I think they're they're. This is just my personal opinion. I think the ideal model goes back to a great uh, usage of providing some kind of verification of ownership for something that makes sense, like whether it's art or a car or property or something like that. I know there's people in the blockchain space that are using it for uh, property ownership sharing. I think that's a really cool way to leverage an NFT besides it being uh, a monkey in a spacesuit. That's, again, just me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, NFTs could be fun. Like, yeah, I was the first one out of everybody tracking this this bomber with this tail number. Like we can do some fun stuff, but like, you know, please come with suggestions on all the fun stuff that could be done later on. Uh, thanks for answering uh, Lord's question, Simeon. There yeah, it's every second. Uh, let's see. Zero cool. Yeah. Have you read it, Mike? You can answer if you read it. No, I, I was going to the CG1 after Hector's, which is, do you have a business plan to expand the scope and provide cell reports to the customers using data by using AI or machine learning models? Am I, where is this question? I, I must, oh, there, sorry. I'm too far down. You spoke yesterday uh, day about one developer who has a, a knack for this kind of stuff. Yeah, so CG, yes, uh, that's part of what we're evaluating. Uh, uh, that's not going to come right now, but like when we have all the when we have all the data, uh, when we have global coverage and really good data, then it opens up for a lot of opportunities to do cool things with the data. Uh, let's see, make sure I don't miss anyone. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, I'm at Sierra Cool's question now. Uh, yes. So if you get a lot of uh, question is, you know, obviously, if you, you get a lot of messages from parked planes, if you can, I, th I think I said it early in this call, the, the best type of data you can get to kind of like maximize your rewards in an area is if you can get the messages from the planes when they're on the runway at the gate and kind of taxiing around because most people cannot get that. So that will actually be a big portion of the data in that hex if you can get all those messages. Uh, that's really important. So that's really cool that you get that. If you look at the map, if you look maybe, for example, at I think Toronto is a good example. Yeah, we have really good coverage there. You can actually see all the main the, the ground vehicles driving around on the on the airport. I think same thing in like Barcelona, Sydney. That's really, really good data. Um just just as a side note for that, yeah, it it's obviously intended that that happens and for you personally and anyone else that has that same kind of situation where they have line of sight or whatever to the to the runways obviously that's going to help you in your rewards because you're capturing all that data while the planes are sitting still normally when we're tracking planes you have them over your airspace for whatever it is let's say 60 seconds a minute two minutes depending on their trajectory and how they're crossing uh, your coverage area. But you have them for a limited period of time. 
Whereas when they're sitting on their tarmac, uh, you are just nonstop collecting data uh, as they move around. Uh, yeah. Real quick, uh, Lord uh, Chief Officer of the Second. I'm just going to keep calling you different names based on <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, how often do the devices send data every hour, every minute? Uh, neither. They're constantly sending data. Like literally as you're sitting here, your packets are being sent out and they will continue to send out uh, every second. I mean, if you're, if you're seeing planes, obviously if you're in an area where planes don't fly over very often, then you're not sending data that often. You're only sending it when the planes are within your tracking range. But if you bring up your TAR 1090 and you see, you know, 100 planes on your map, uh, trust me, you are sending a lot of data constantly. Uh, so, Mike, just say, I, I have to wrap this up in 24 minutes because I still have quite a lot of work to do. Um, so, but we'll do 24 more minutes if people want to. Um, and then we can do more stages uh, next week if needed. Roger that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, everybody. I'm in, uh, I'm in Europe. So, it's uh, 6.36 p.m. So, I, I have to finish up the day. Um, I have quite a lot of work left. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate you joining. Muchas gracias, I guess, in Spain, you said. Awesome. All right. Opening for any new questions, final stuff. Portugal. What am I? Yeah, if, if people want to post, where is everyone from? Post post where you're from. That'd be really fun. If you if you don't if you don't want to, of course, don't, but be exciting to see. Don't post your address. Real quick while people yeah, are yeah. posting that. Uh, since we got in the fire truck kick for a second. We took nice. a family vacation when we were, uh, many years ago, my oldest was really young. Firefighters are so cool. We were in some small mountain town and we kept driving by this, uh, fire station that was at the end of the road where our cabin was. And one day they were out there, uh, I guess, cleaning the fire trucks. And my son wanted to like see him. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we don't have time for that. And I'm like, you know what? This is an opportunity. We turned around and went and talked to him. Next thing you know, my, my son's getting a complete tour. He's in the things. And then they're like, they opened up one of the hoses and he's standing out there. I don't know. He's like two feet tall at the time, holding one of those giant fire hoses with help from a firefighter and spraying it right towards the street where everybody's driving. It was an amazing experience. So if you have a chance and you have kids, definitely hit up the firefighters. They're awesome people. Well, maybe awesome. not all of them. So we got Spain, Portugal, France, Romania, uh zero this may be an ignorant question so i apologies in advance where is Balearic islands it sounds really cool i would love to know where it is cape town south africa very nice england awesome amsterdam one of my favorite cities uh good old us southwest us jfk latvia really cool Man, this is awesome Ah, cool. Okay. I see, Sierra. Thank you for the clarification. Now I know. Costa Rica. Wow. Pittsburgh. Awesome. Oh, Germany. Very nice. Yeah. <clears throat> Turkey. Yeah, I see Turkey has a bunch of, bunch of cool antennas. That's awesome. As, I mean, it's... I, I, I said this yesterday. Like I've never built stuff in the Web three. Like I never built a project in Web three before. Just traditional businesses. I built quite a few, but like the community aspect of this and just seeing people from all over the world is like it's the most amazing thing ever. Uh, and it's so much fun just seeing people in the channels, like helping each other, collaborating, helping. You know, everyone's kind of growing together. It's uh, really, really exciting. Uh, I'm gonna not say this right. Er, er, er to gruel uh mentioned he's from turkey but also asked about documentation can we have documentation ah. in different languages uh to explain these developments in the project not necessarily just this one but all probably all future ones uh i am not a great translator no so we actually uh, me and alex I, I don't know if you were we talked about that because uh, both when it comes to, you know, Discord, having maybe when we get big enough, having local channels for different countries, uh, but also, 
you know, that's to Simeon's point, uh, opening up, you know, open source the documentation and potentially allocate some, you know, tokens to for people contributing so that that way the community together could build this thing. Uh, so that would, uh, yes, it's in the plan. We would love to have it in different languages to make it easier for people. Yes, yeah, oh yeah, same, yeah, you, uh, you, I saw your comment there. I actually, I actually said it before I saw your comment, but yeah, I agree. Open source is, is the way to go there. Kiko dog. All right, everybody, we're gonna, we're gonna take some time. We're gonna walk Kiko dog through his installation or her installation in real time. Everybody else will just have to sit here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but Kiko dog, uh, how about I uh, contact with you outside of this uh, and I can help you. Yeah, if you open a ticket, Kiko dog, that would be so we don't, uh, so we can keep track of it and we'll, we'll, we'll help. Let's see, Lord. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, so Lord, uh, on your question there, it could be two reasons. Like legally, they actually have to keep the transponder on until they park at the gate and plug in that power cord uh, when they're uh, sitting still. It's actually very difficult getting good coverage on an airport. Uh, most of the time you actually would have to have, especially on a large airport, you have to have several transponders on the airport at very good locations to get full uh, overview. So most likely it's just that you, you, you just can't catch it anymore. Uh, it disappears. They don't turn off the signal until they park. Yeah, so a fun... Uh mental experiment if you want to look at a local airport and then try to look where if you were not physically on airport grounds where could you install an antenna that would provide coverage for the runways and i've looked at quite a few airports and it can be really challenging based on where they typically have airports and what objects are around them because uh, obviously people people don't want to live literally next to an airport um so you end up with a lot of industrial and hotel type stuff so interesting challenge to identify where you could have it to get full coverage and track stuff non-stop yeah but the goal the goal for like uh if you look at on a business and customer point of view is if you can reach about 75 to 80 percent coverage of uh, on-ground traffic at an airport that's very very good uh, Rotor Rocket, was it published yet? No, yesterday's chat is not yet published. Unless I'm wrong, Mike, but I don't think so. It, it's not. I have a, a slight challenge with that, but uh, I can discuss off off stage, yeah. stage left. Yep. See, Cello, are there any plans to get people? Oh, like a staking? Uh, we had a question earlier about staking cello, and that's nothing we're planning on right now. Uh, we're we're, we're going to provide enough liquidity um, without, um, you know, so we don't have to have people staking to do that uh, right off the bat. Yeah, uh, tubers, I mean, if I'm telling you, like, if you can get an antenna with overview on the airport, it will be amazing for everybody. Uh, but for us, from a business perspective, for you, from a rewards perspective. Uh, CG lives next to, or close to an airport, wondering about antennas inside versus outside and what impact that has on the data. That is going to be wholly dependent on what kind of residence or, or, or building you live in or where you've got it. There are all kinds of RF obstructions, double pane glass, uh, concrete, just the general building materials, like even putting it in an attic versus uh, one attic versus another. Some people have either metal roofs or they have foil lined uh, insulation in their attics. So it's really difficult to say like how much better it would be outside versus inside. Uh, the, the best way you could probably do it is uh, <laughs> So I know this sounds odd. Uh, grab the antenna, walk outside. If the cable will reach and like just hold it up in the air 
and hopefully have a laptop or something nearby so you can in real time kind of see the numbers changing on tar 1090 um but yeah there yeah i can tell you right now uh my unit that i use for testing and for whatever video stuff and everything is in my office i'm on the first floor there's a giant double pane window i tried to move it to the side so it's behind like the wood frame of the window uh, but none of it's great. I, I have literally almost no signal where it's at versus if I were to just walk outside and put it in front of the house, I would actually, uh, be doing much better. And I know that just based on my regular install in my location yeah. does really well. Uh, let's see where, what the question, ba, 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 ba. Road Rock, that's really cool that you're able to get the runway info. Yeah, runway info is the best. It's like the diamonds of the flight data. Uh, Dark Brown, rough timeline on 978 tracking support. So the reason we're not focusing on that right now is it's because it's not a request from our customers. to They don't really care about it. Uh, so right at this moment, it's not a priority. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Gotcha. Okay. See a few people popping, popping in and out. So we'll we'll have we have 14 more minutes of the stage. So any more questions, feel free to shoot. Um, and again, for people that maybe joined recently, you, you can ask a question about anything. If you don't have a specific question about the change, you whatever, whatever you wonder, you can ask. Uh, let's see. Cello, someone actually was discussing that. Um, somebody who, who works on platforms. So in some cases, it depends on where. I I actually I, I did one of those dives that you don't intend to do. Like you you look so somebody says something, you look it up, and next thing you know, you're you're researching, and I'm like looking at all the oil rigs in uh near Alaska. I'm looking at oil rigs in other locations, I, I'm researching more. Turns out a lot of them work sometimes very short shifts, sometimes very long shifts, as in like three months or six months or even up to a year. So there's challenges there as, as a participant that you are only on site and you can have that set up. And I'm not even sure what the logistics and legalities are of plopping up your own antenna somewhere on the oil rig versus the company. Uh, so actually, uh, we, I can answer this one actually, because oh. we have a, we have a person that's advising us that's been part of building one of the other major uh, flight tracking networks. Um, and they actually have a few oil rigs with these antennas. So there's two things here. If you, if you get it on the oil rig, uh, depending on where it is, you may only get the helicopters that transport people to the oil rig. But if you go on like one of the big flight tracking networks like Flight Radar or Flight Aware, and you can kind of see where all the flight patterns are. And if you have an oil rig that can get the plane, some planes um, over sea, then I, I think it'd be worth it. Uh, otherwise, you most likely only get the helicopters, which is cool, but it's not, you know, everyday kind of thing. And then there'll be several days with no data at all. It'd still be fun if somebody here wants to work on an oil maybe rig please. let us know we'd yeah. love to check yeah, it out maybe maybe we'll get a bonus just for getting it there and take a picture as a proof it yeah cello it depends on where the oil rig is i mean if it's close to shoreline it would probably be a really good idea um you know close enough to actually get some planes also over shore um, if it's in a you know kind of like there's oil rigs outside norway for example you know because all the planes you know, kind of end up flying from over Greenland, just by the shape of the earth. So then you probably get some cool stuff, uh, but it depends. One really interesting area is Gulf of Mexico. Um, yeah, it, there's cool. a lot of rigs there and there's a ton of flight traffic uh, that crosses over the Gulf to head south and come back north. So that's kind of cool. Although I have noticed that a lot of those uh, flights will get tracked by people that are basically, I guess, near the shorelines uh, surrounding the Gulf. So. Yeah. Uh, Lord chief officer of the two, like Mike said, are balloons and helicopter data important like the rest, uh, from, from a rewards perspective, from a participant. Yes. 
uh, from our perspective, not so important for like selling the data, but it's still really cool to get it. So I wouldn't be mad if we had helicopter and balloon data. Uh, if you can pick up a rocket like SpaceX. No, uh, I mean, I'm not a rocket expert, but I don't think any rocket would have this type of transponder on it. Uh, so it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't send out the signal. If it did, you'd have like two data points. Oh, it's there and then in there. Oh, it's in space. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. So drone data, that's an in interesting question because I know there's like debate about this, how to track drones. But so what the regulations say for drones is that they have to transmit their ID if they're over 250 grams in weight. But on a really small drone, you have neither the power to transmit ADS-B signal, nor that like you can't carry this transponder, so it have to be done by 5G. Now, if you have a massive drone that's you know, size, you know, unmanned aircraft kind of deal that's big, then you know either they would have ADS-B or maybe a different fre frequency in the future. But for all small drones, it's going to be 5G signal that tracks them. I'm just going to ask the obvious question. Uh, Lord Cello, uh, owner of the second, can you, can you tell us what it actually stands for? So I can, so I can say it right. <laughs> oh, uh, Cello, the diamonds of the data for wing bits is uh, the data signal that the planes send out when they're on the ground. It's the same signal, but if you can capture it when they're, you know, rolling around on the runway on an airport, that's really, really valuable data. I mean, that I would suspect that leads to a whole bunch of logistics stuff where even airport logistics can figure out, like, what's our delays on moving stuff through and other Entities could also use that to see why perhaps uh, flights are delayed in certain airports. Is it due to traffic and, and people all lining up? Yeah, but you can, you know, for example, another cool use case, if you have, if you have all the data from the runway, you know, an airplane, they report takeoff when wheels leave the ground and landing is when they touch down. So as soon as wheels touch the ground, they send two unique data points on what, those two occasions. But then, you know, they may be waiting to park at the gate for 30 minutes where they're, you know, releasing fumes and exhausts. And so you can actually get a better accuracy on like what's the actual CO2 footprint of a plane if you have 100% from gate to gate because they are it's kind of self-reporting. Got it. All right, we're down to seven minutes remaining. Seven minutes, yeah. people ask your final questions uh radar box yeah i mean the radar box kit is really good um a little bit annoying to see that they keep raising the price because a lot of people are going there to buy so it's quite frustrating uh we've been thinking should we source some of our own stuff but uh probably just gonna focus on building our own device uh because you know it's a whole logistics nightmare sourcing all the antennas making sure they're good you know finding 3pl you know, logistics providers all over the world. But it is frustrating that they keep raising the price. Uh, let's see. Uh, I will, ship just just oh, as a follow-up to that. So I, I do have uh, the green dongle sitting here in the office. I also have a FlightAware one. It works just as well. So um, obviously you want to make sure, I, I would hope everyone here is already probably got the hardware and doesn't have the question, but just make sure that it is the proper color that represents 1090 megahertz, not the 978, unless you're doing that intentionally. And then ideally look for the one that already has a filter and a LNA, uh, sorry, a filter and an amp on board. Uh, that'll probably be the right choice. And there's literally one for each ADSB exchange has one, flight aware and radar box or air nav. So, yeah. and air spy as, uh, Simeon just mentioned. Yeah. 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 For sure. 
uh, Lord CO2 to 2, uh, will you add ship tracking later in the future? So I, I think someone asked a question yesterday about will we expand into different data points? And so the focus now is to on ADSB and why that is the focus is because we want to prove to all you guys, to the community that we can make this work and provide value for you. After we have proven that, then we would be in a good position to maybe ask you to track something else. And I mean, ship data would obviously make somewhat sense because it's very similar to what we're tracking, very little adjustment, but we haven't made any decisions, but we just want to prove to everyone here that we can add value doing this, then we can make that decision at that point. Uh, new and yes, and Doc Brown to your comment, who knows, but uh, as a side note, their antenna is pretty good too. And on Amazon, it has not moved in price. So it is a very good option, inexpensive option to get in. Uh, Toomber says, how about ACARS? You would have to educate me. I know I've read this somewhere, so please educate me exactly what that is, but that's nothing we have looked into. Uh, if I am not incorrect, ACARS is the method by which it's a different messaging where you, they, it's like almost text messaging, uh, between, yeah. uh, the, the craft and, uh, air traffic control or whatever. And you'll see things like them talking about, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to bring it around 180 or something. I, I would love to read more about it. I started to, and then got distracted on something else, but the messages and the examples looked really cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, let's let's check it out. Uh, Janu says, what other data would even be an option? I mean, uh, like, uh, sorry, I can't remember who mentioned Lord. I mean, AIS ship data would be one of the options because you can track it with a similar setup. You need a different, obviously, different antenna to capture that signal, but that would be a cool that, that data point that have good synergy with uh, ADSB data because they're both kind of, you know, transportation, mobility. Uh, but outside of that, I don't, I haven't considered any other, uh, other data points. I mean, there's probably a trillion data points you can capture, but you don't want to capture them just to capture them. You need to make sure you can sell them. Otherwise, there's really no point for this type of project to capture them. Uh, for anybody just recently joining, uh, welcome, but there's three minutes left. Uh, we will do another one uh, next week. Uh, we'll yeah. schedule one in advance this time. So it's not a surprise gift, uh, kind of situation. We'll, we'll give a heads up. Uh, it'll be a scheduled event. You'll be able to, uh, figure out where you'll be, uh, and what, how to participate. Yeah. And we, we may, you know, really, we need to do like one earlier for the people that are East of here and one at this time, maybe a little later for everybody and in, in the, on the U S side. And Europe also, of course. So yeah, Gamma, uh, thanks for showing up here. Uh, sorry, it's only a couple of minutes left. Uh, the reason there's a couple of minutes left is I have a lot of work to do, uh, and it's 7 p.m. here. And and we've been doing this for almost 90 minutes now, so not too bad. Yeah, yeah no, no, Janice, thank you. I, I appreciate uh, everyone showing up yesterday and today. I mean, the fact that you've been sitting here for so long, I mean, it's 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 really cool to see. So I really really appreciate it. I have some last minute questions coming in. I mean, in a, just Se gonna, several just, people <laughs> are typing. <laughs> yeah, suspense is going up. Yeah, Simeon, thank you so much for for joining and linking all the stuff and for your input. Really appreciate it. Uh, but again, guys, uh, we will schedule some uh, stages for next week so people can plan in advance. Uh, bring some questions if you have them. Obviously, you can post them at any point, but if you have ones you want to ask live, hold hold on to them. Uh, again, thanks for being in the project. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, wouldn't We wouldn't be where we are without all of you guys in the community. So massive thanks to all of you and have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. See you guys.